And now, it's time for that great new game show. It's the PowerShell Podcast. It's all about PowerShell and the PowerShell community. The PowerShell Podcast. And now, here's your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. Hey everybody, welcome back to PowerShell Podcast. I'm Ultra Mega Superstar Jordan, along with the other guy. The other guy. <laughs> I feel like I've been alternating between uh, mean and nice recently. I like the high praise. I like the nice ones. But hey, whatever <laughs> whatever happens, I'm ready. <laughs> I think well, we've had a, a bunch of different ones throughout the episodes. As, as long as you put me in charge of the start, it is going to be manic all over the place. You never know. Well, keep us guessing. Good. We keep tuning in every week. And I didn't put this in our show notes, Jordan, but a little bit of a surprise. We got some awesome feedback from Dan Schroeder, who said, I discovered the PowerShell podcast in May and started listening from episode one. I've listened to every episode, catching up on the latest one today. Great job, Jordan and Andrew Plotek. So much great PowerShell info for everyone from beginner to expert and lots of fun along the way. I highly recommend it. Keep it up, guys. Oh, I, I saw that while I was at Spice World, and it really... uh touched my heart really appreciate the kind words thank you so much to all of our listeners who have listened to every single episode you've been with us you've grown with us we're going to keep growing together i'm always curious for people that listen to it back to back when they first discover it, how jarring our change is when we because we started off with just i believe just the two of us talking about things that we read up on mm -hmm. and we changed track pretty quick but uh yeah at the beginning, I thought, you know, we thought, oh, we couldn't interview enough people. Like, we're going to run out after like 20. And it's like, no, not even close. <laughs> we're just getting started out here. Thanks, everyone, for being along for the ride. But, so you saw it at Spice World. How was that? Spice World was awesome. There was a lot of awesome PowerShell content, some PowerShell people. People came by, some listeners of the podcast and stuff. Um, got to spend some good quality time with Jeff Hicks, Sean Wheeler, James Petty, Joe Hughes, and Jason Helmick and hit up some cool little places to eat and got some good PowerShell time in. So it was awesome. Sounds like time well spent. Yes. And for some projects that we want to highlight, the first one from our good friend Christian Ritter, he has a PS Mermaid project, which is to easily create Mermaid Markdown files in PowerShell, um, which is pretty cool. I haven't played around with Mermaid graph things in, in quite a while. But it seems like a pretty cool PowerShell project to get your toe in the door. And I think just the name Mermaid just makes me want to like hang out with it more and discover where it came from. I, I still um, don't fully understand Markdown. I don't want to learn new variations. Of... Oh, you don't want to learn Markdown? It's like just text-based stuff with like, eh, it's just text. I said I don't want to. I said I don't. I, every time it's uh, I go to write in, it's, uh, it, it's almost... Like uh, regex for me. Every time I it's like, oh, I need to use it. I've forgotten how everything works. I think it's a good one to learn because it's all over the internet. Like Slack uses some form of Markdown. Discord does. Um, but hey, maybe this is our chance. Maybe we'll play with it by next week. He also has another cool project for the code golf enthusiasts called PS Command Shortener, and it basically takes a PowerShell script block and it replaces um, command names with aliases. And it does some cool stuff with the abstract syntax tree. Um, so definitely a project worth playing around with and looking at how it works. Probably be insightful. PS resource get release candidate is also here. So that's a complete change to like a core how PowerShell grabs things, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, sort of. Um, it's the new method for getting packages and I guess PowerShell get. I like how the answer was clearly no, but you're too nice. It's like, yeah, sort of. Well, there was that you're, thing where you're really correct. they explained how you could kind of use both and there would be an update to PowerShell get um, that would like, I guess, allow you to call PS resource get. I think in our episode with Sydney, we talked about it. I don't recall all the implementation details, but definitely worth checking out and giving some feedback because it is a candidate for release. And Last blog I thought was kind of cool. It's kind of like a story, sort of. It is a blog about debugging convert to JSON by our friend of the podcast, Josh Hendricks. It is helpful uh, to read through to kind of understand how to start debugging things and breaking things down um, with a bit of a complex project that they were dealing with. Highly recommend giving that a read. But Jordan, I think we got a pretty special guest today. Yeah, people are, people are tired of us. Let's bring on the, the real star. 
they got the their show. taste. They're done. They're ready for the main course. What do we're we have here, today? We're here to talk PowerShells and security with uh, Miriam Wiesner. Hopefully, Hi welcome. there. Hello. There you are. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's a busy time for you and I appreciate you being able to pencil us into your schedule. Thank you for having me. So super excited to speak uh, to speaking with you. Awesome. So recently, I, I, we've actually mentioned you on the podcast several times, especially when we talk to Fred. Um, I don't know if you work with Fred a lot at Microsoft, but he has said a lot of great things about you and pointed us to your book, I believe. And then we ended up tracking you down and saying, hey, we got to get you on. Thanks. So uh, unfortunately, I don't work that often with Fred, but from time to time, our paths cross. And I don't know, I think we, we met in 2018 or something the first time. And I also had to tell so many great things about Fred also at Microsoft. And this was when he also joined Microsoft. And so, yeah. Nice. That's exciting. So what I know you've been at Microsoft for almost six years. What do you do at Microsoft? How has your job kind of changed over the years? So actually, I started as a Premier Field Engineer. Back then, it was still called Premier Field Engineer. Now it's called Customer Engineer. And I was working um, with customers, and um, I had different kind of, kind of engagements. So uh, I had some, yeah, static customers, and I had some customers some random customers where I went to and performed um, assessments, so security assessments. And after um, being a PFE, I became a program manager for uh, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, and which also got merged later in Microsoft 365 Defender. And uh, I was there uh, also seeing the conversion, working on the conversion. And um, last but not least, now that's my current role. Um, that's a role that I dreamt of for years. Um, I always wanted to work as a security researcher. And I got finally hired in the position of my dreams. And now I'm working as a security researcher and um, working on the detections behind Microsoft 365 Defender. That is very exciting. So if I heard correctly, you were a PM for a little bit, which seems like a bit of a pace change from being a PFE, right? You're more yes. in charge of managing the product and features and feedback and all that kind of thing. Um, it was still a technical role. So you had to be uh, on top of the product and uh, work with the customers. But it was the hastiest role, if you can say it like that, uh, that I ever had. So I remember that I never, in this entire role, I never managed to get a uh, hold of my inbox. I, I just never had a clean inbox, although I tried. And um, it was also really, really challenging, I would say, to just jump from one meeting into another meeting. So you had loads of customers that you worked with and you just needed to prepare for the other meeting and you had maybe half an hour per day or maybe half an hour between those meetings uh, to prepare for, for the other meeting. And that was quite tricky, but somehow it worked. So uh, yeah, so now after uh, that role, I just, yeah, I just felt like uh, all the meetings disappeared from my calendar uh, I still have meetings in my calendar, but uh, I just got some some time to breathe back. Nice. And a dream role while you're at it. Yes. So I think it's safe to say at this point that not only are you a security researcher, but you wrote the book on security. Uh, not particularly on security, <laughs> <laughs> but on PowerShell security. <laughs> oh, you got it. Yes, you know it. You know it. <laughs> Yay. I also yeah. have it here. Oh, yeah, twinsies. <laughs> yeah, PowerShell Automation and Scripting for Cybersecurity is the name of your book, and we'll definitely have a link to it in the show notes for people to check it out. Um, it's a pretty impressive book. I imagine it was quite the undertaking. Thank you. Yes, um, that was the biggest project I ever worked on. Um, I think um, the, the publisher uh, contacted me in 2020 
uh, if I wanted to to write the book for them. And first I was completely insecure and was not sure if I would be able to write that book because, uh, yeah, the description already felt heavy. And after some brainstorming, I was like, well, there are only some topics that I need to research. And basically, I already know a lot of those topics that they asked. And so I accepted. And then in 2021, I started and finally finished the book with a short break of, uh, yeah, giving birth to my wonderful son. So, yeah. Well, congratulations on that. That's exciting as Thank well. Thank you. Um, who would, what would you say the purpose of this book is? Like to people, you know, they understand the title, but what's, what does this book aim to do? So I tried to make this book understandable for all beginners and advanced um, readers. And the book basically explores PowerShell features from a security point of view and um, also gives recommendations. So what to configure, what not to configure, and um, also explores several features um, also from a research point of view. So for example, we are also looking at the network screen, uh, stream. Um, if PowerShell remoting is really encrypted by default, if you only use HTTP, mm. um, and also mm. it's structured in three parts. So the first part is getting started with PowerShell security, also with PowerShell. And the second part is diving deeper into the system, um, Active Directory, uh, Azure AD, or uh, now called Entra ID. And um, yeah, we also have a part uh, with a red team and blue team um, cookbook so that you have some handy PowerShell snippets, some handy scripts that you can use for your uh, daily use. And last but not least, we also have the mitigations so that you know what is there from PowerShell perspective, what can help you to make your environment more secure. And also we will look in the third part also on some options on how adversaries can attack those mitigations and what they are doing. That is awesome. That is definitely explains why the book is so thick. There's a lot of awesome content <laughs> in there. Um, I know we've talked to, I guess, Fred a few times about how to approach PowerShell security, but I think that having a book in front of you that you can go to, that you can look things up is massively helpful. Um, I haven't read the whole thing, but I was reading through parts of it, and it definitely seems like it guides you on the right path if you're working in PowerShell at your organization and you want to start actually implementing some of the security features that PowerShell has, I highly recommend checking out this book. It is worth its weight in gold. It is very inexpensive relative to the value that it adds. So I recommend hitting up your manager, getting it approved, just getting it shipped to your door um, so you can start implementing some PowerShell security. And to me, it just seems a little bit more approachable when it's in that page-by-page -page format. At least for me, I don't get so lost in my head at, oh, I need to do all these millions of things. It's like, oh, you can kind of just defer to the book and, and take... Miriam's excellent perspective into account and, and take advantage of all those insights. Thank you so much for those nice words. Thanks for the nice book. It, for people who, you know, try and profess, oh, PowerShell security, it, it is nice to have a great new resource that we can point people to um, because it does, in my experiences working with people, it can be a little daunting to have them uh, have those conversations and get, it, get that process started. Yeah. I think security is one of those that if you don't go in there with a security mindset, like that's what you're used to is the hardest part of PowerShell because you're never really sure. It's one if you get it wrong, you're at the most risk. So more information is better in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. So what were some of the challenges you ran into in writing this book? Uh, so first big challenge is procrastination. <laughs> So, uh, well, when you start, you are super motivated, but after some chapters, you just fell into the habit to write. And at some point, yeah, your mobile phone looks very, very uh, intriguing <laughs> and interesting. And so it was really hard to stay focused and to not get distracted. 
and um, of course, uh, another uh, big challenge was um, I planned to finish the book before my son would be born. And yeah, I already planned with everything. And then the pregnancy was also quite challenging. So I did not manage that. And um, yeah, when you have a toddler or a baby, basically, uh, he was a baby back then. When you have a baby, uh, he requires all of your time. And then it was really challenging to get the book finished. So uh, I'm really, really thankful that my husband supported me in the best way he could. He managed the entire house and uh, yeah, just had my, had my back for everything. And um, so just also the finishing line was really hard to reach in the end. But um, then, yeah, I made it. Yay. <laughs> Sounds like it was quite the journey to get there and very respectable. Um, really appreciate you being able to manage all that in life. You know, it's like, it's admirable. I should say, I look up to that. I, I'd like to Thank be as strong as you one day. Thank you. I, I feel like this is getting me in trouble because my boss that edits this has been talking to me about my missed writing deadlines and I don't have a fraction of that going on. I still can't hit a deadline. So this make me look real bad. I, I crash all the deadlines, so don't, don't there, worry. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty relatable, especially the whole procrastination thing. Um, I think many of us deal with that very often. Yeah, and what, what I did to overcome this at some point um, was the um, toma to tomato, tomato? Pomodoro <laughs> technique? Uh, pomodoro, pono oh, yeah, pomodoro technique, sorry. <laughs> It is a tomato, yeah. so it's fair. <laughs> yeah, so so pomodoro. Uh, I I just thought of toma tomato uh, in German, and uh, yeah, so the pomodoro technique, and uh, you just basically you uh, work twenty five minutes focus, and then you have five minutes to relax and to check your messages, and like that, um, I could trick myself into staying focused, at least for some time. So. Yeah. Great call out. Earlier today, I was thinking to myself, gosh, I feel so overwhelmed with dealing with everything. What do I normally do? And it's like, oh, yeah, I listen to my focus music. I do the Pomodoro technique. I make sure to write notes of what I have going on because otherwise I just get so lost in my brain. And it yeah. seems like I'm often relearning the same lessons, like on a two year cycle. Like I kind of learn them, oh, things are going really well, kind of start dropping off. And it's like, oh. <laughs> so appreciate the call out to the Pomodoro technique. I think a lot of people find that pretty helpful. Yeah, it's great. Now, when did you start specializing in PowerShell? Was it after security where you were like in environments where like, oh, there's a ton of PowerShell here. We need someone who knows what they're doing or where did you get involved in PowerShell? Let me think. Um, I think at some point when I worked as an administrator mm -hmm. because you just need PowerShell. Um, this is when I started with PowerShell, but I did not really look into PowerShell security at that point. Um, that came later. That was when, when I uh, worked at Microsoft. And um, yeah, because it's yeah quite close there. Um, and I was really obsessed with GIA at the beginning, so just enough administration. And um, I was super, super excited about Jia. And I told all my customers, yes, you should use Jia. And all my customers were like, man, that's really hard to implement. <laughs> so how can we make that easier? And um, yeah, back then I came up with a G analyzer. And um, this project is a project that Fred took over at some point because I just switched roles and um, with projects and I could not really work on it any longer, unfortunately, because it's, it's, it's still a great project. And um, yeah, so if you haven't checked it out, uh, G-Analyzer, um, it helps you to not only uh, analyze what your users are running as commands in your environment, you can, for example, pipe in uh, event um, logs to 
create an, a Jira initial configuration, you can also pipe in scripts and create your Jira configurations. And you should also ask Fred because he also implemented a lot of good features in there recently. So um, I think I can't describe the entire uh, feature set, but yeah, so basically this is what um, was intended in the beginning. Cool, that's uh, quite the experience. So you became a PFE and you started running into PowerShell and engagements more often. And then eventually over time, you just kind of developed the expertise yeah. in it from seeing it so many times in different environments. Yeah, basically, yes. So. What do you say to people that think PowerShell is insecure and like, oh, another hack that used PowerShell. Ha ha, that's why I don't use that language. What do you say to those people? Basically, it's not PowerShell um, because it's basically how the people configure the systems because PowerShell is secure by default if you don't change anything crucial. And um, I also talk to people or especially CISOs that say PowerShell is insecure, let's just disable PowerShell. And that's not the best idea because they just usually block PowerShell Axie. And uh, yeah, uh, that's not the best solution because uh, attackers can basically circumvent that and write their own binaries and execute them. So there are also a lot of yeah pre-coded options like uh, Power as as HDLL. Um, with which you can run PowerShell commands without PowerShell, and uh, yeah, attackers just can yeah just uh, code their way around it. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So blocking it will not only you know prevent your admins from automating and administering, but it still isn't always that effective um, at preventing actual execution of PowerShell. Yeah. So it's still used, but you miss out on all the awesome logging you would have had if it was available. That as well. Yeah. So say you have a secured environment and, okay, someone gets access to a box and they start executing malicious PowerShell. Where can you look to see that or what should your response be when an attacker is using PowerShell, assuming that you have all the controls set up that you mentioned in your book? Yeah, basically... Um... The event logs are uh, the, the best place if the attacker does not um, alter them. So there's also, of course, a way uh, that attackers can change event logs, but usually they still leave traces. So uh, there is still a way uh, that uh, you can find yeah, um, evidence mm -hmm. that um, an attacker was on your system or altered your event logs, but if the attacker did not alter the event logs, uh, the best uh, option is to look in the PowerShell operational event logs, uh, depending if you uh, configured it only for Windows PowerShell or also for PowerShell Core. Um, yeah, th there are different event logs for both. And um, you can uh, yeah, just, just find um, the script log logging events and I think it was 4104, the script lo block logging mm -hmm. events, uh, that the event ID that you need to look for. And um, yeah, basically you can, if you have script block logging enabled, uh, you can basically find out all the commands and also the scripts that an attacker was running. And um, in my book or for my book, I have also created a nice uh, script that you can use to uh, get all the multi parts together uh, as one output. Mm, okay. And you're saying script block logging, and that is a feature in PowerShell, the deep script block logging. I think it's a feature that you have to like turn on um, using some policies or registry or whatever. But I think that that's a really cool aspect of PowerShell. PowerShell. What is the deep script block logging? And what does it help us get visibility into? What do you mean with deep script block logging? So there, there is script block logging. 
So I might be just adding the word deep to it because <laughs> my memory <laughs> says it, but I, or maybe I just think because it is able to dig sort of deeper into the code and see what's actually being ran rather than I think the obfuscated commands potentially. So it kind of, if an attacker uses obfuscated commands, the deep script block logging allows you to see what it's actually doing. I think that's basically in combination with ANS, with the anti-malware uh, script. Um, uh, I don't, I missed the I. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that a lot of times whenever interface, I see... Interface, interface. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anti-malware scan, scan interface. That's it. Um, that's it. Sorry, I always use the abbreviation. So I basically never use the entire uh, word. Um, so basically uh, the obfuscated part um, is most of the time deobfuscated by AMC. And therefore uh, you can then see it deobfuscated. So uh, AMC is a great uh, feature as well, which also helps you uh, securing your environment and which also prevents attackers from running obviously malicious code. Because it kind of scans it and can determine like say, no, no. Yes, exactly. So uh, when an attacker attempts to run malicious code, so for example, easiest example, in invoke mimikatz, um, the command before it's even run is sent to AMSI, to the interface. And uh, then uh, AMC determines if the code is legit uh, or if the code is malicious. And if the code is malicious, it's blocked. And if it's legit, then uh, it can be run. And of course, there are ways to bypass AMC, but uh, yeah, it's getting better and better. And it's gotten really, really hard to bypass it. Yeah. Do you think Invoke Mimikatz is one that most security products are able to pick up these days? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah so th this was meant to be an easy an, exa an easy example. Yeah, cool. Now, what's the sentiment in the security world? Have you seen it change? Like, have you seen more people in the security world understand that blocking PowerShell isn't the answer and securing PowerShell is the answer? Um, or, you know, because for me, I think viewing the security world, it feels like for a while PowerShell was a bit of a joke, you know, oh, it's so insecure, blah, blah, blah. But I think I see more and more people who aren't heavily involved in the PowerShell space that are saying like, hey, no, you need to secure it. Actually, I think governments, uh, I think we covered that before in the podcast where the governments are like, no, 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 you need to lock down PowerShell and take advantage of it to secure your systems, not just block it. I think it's still split. Um, I see more and more people moving using PowerShell because, well, if you have PowerShell enabled and if uh, the right uh, detection mechanisms are in place, then you are so powerful that you see basically everything that uh, the attacker is trying to do and you can better respond to the actions. Um, of course, the, the organization needs to be big enough to have all these, uh, these measures in place. Um, but yes, I, I saw many organizations uh, who were using PowerShell to their advantage. Uh, but I still, uh, yeah, I still talk to many organizations that were like, um, yeah, PowerShell is uh, dangerous because attackers are using it. But basically, uh, yeah, PowerShell is just one tool that attackers are trying to abuse. And basically everything else is dangerous as well because, uh, well, an exe file, if you execute it, you're also lost. So, yeah. Yeah, you can use other scripting languages or, or many, many things. I think what I hear a lot is that security professionals are very happy when you select PowerShell because of all the security features. Exactly. Um, so you that, that, yeah, yeah, that is one thing uh, that PowerShell has a big advantage of other uh, yeah, scripting languages. Um, so basically uh, other scripting languages, most of the time they don't have the, the deep logging features uh, that PowerShell offers or uh, yeah, sending all the code to AMSI before it's run. So uh, yeah. 
yeah, you can definitely get it pretty locked down. Um, is there one feature in particular that you think is underutilized? Like one, one simple part of, you know, there, and it's a bigger picture to secure all of PowerShell and remoting and all that, but is there one feature that you think is like the easiest win or most underutilized? So the easiest win, when you said that, you just caught me because I was just smiling and I was like thinking, Gia, 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 Gia. <laughs> but um, it's not that easy to configure it and to set it up. But I think it's still underrated um, because just with, with Gia, just enough administration, you can just lock down the commands that your users are allowed to run. You can even, uh, yeah, configure a local user to have certain administrator rights on his computer or her computer uh, without allowing the user to be an administrator. So, and I, I, I really, I'm still a big fan of Gia, <laughs> but uh, it's not that easy, quick win, but yeah. What is assume breach and should organizations be having an assume breach mindset? Definitely, they should. So assume breach is um, the mindset that you don't ask yourself if you are being hacked, but when. Because nowadays, you cannot say that uh, you never get hacked. So I, I, I know I talked to companies that said, well, we are completely secure. We do have a firewall, a hardware firewall. We do have antivirus. We are safe. We are not getting hacked. But this is not the case any longer because uh, attackers are also doing their best to achieve their goal. And often uh, they also use social engineering to trick the users into clicking links, into opening documents and executing macros or anything else and um, can happen to everybody. So even to the best security people. That's to me, the, the biggest thing that you can never account for, even with training is the user. They're always yeah. going to, I mean, not, not always, but it feels to me like the biggest security vulnerability is because it's the one that you can't do anything outside of training for is don't click on that bad link. The CEO does not want you to buy gift cards. Yeah. So, and basically, uh, it's not only clicking on links. So it's also possible just by viewing an email uh, to get infected uh, in some cases. This month, there was a, uh, a reading pane for Microsoft Word. that, If it's in the, the preview pane, it can execute the code. Yes, exactly. And uh, I don't know where I read it, but I recently read it that I think uh, most of the users are opening a phishing email, even if they already assume that it's a phishing email. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe not that many click on links in phishing emails, but still enough. But um, just the fact that they think, oh, nice, it's a phishing email, so let me just read through it. Uh, it nothing will happen. So that's already really dangerous. Mm, that's a good call out. So I think um, some organizations implement a little button to report your emails to you know the security team. And if you can't do that from the preview pane, well, you know you could mm. be viewing the email. So I wonder if there's some better training people should go under for that. Like if it looks super suspicious, delete Deleted. it. And, and let your admins know that you deleted an email and they can look it up. Yeah. Good call out. Now, I'm, I'll ask this in a way that hopefully won't get you in any trouble, but can you take us through a hypothetical, typical security scenario where someone, it doesn't have to be PowerShell, but let's just say for the, this case, someone uses PowerShell, like how they get access. You mentioned uh, phishing is a pretty common way, but they get access and maybe what they try and do, how they take advantage of one endpoint and spread. Yeah, basically, uh, yeah, most of the time it's phishing. So, uh, yeah, if the attacker manages to get the user opening or uh, the, the email or clicking on the link, uh, then uh, the payload is downloaded and executed. And uh, then, well, 
in some cases, they use PowerShell to uh, reach their goal. And it depends what their goal is. So uh, there are uh, yeah, many po possibilities uh, that attackers are yeah, pursuing. So one thing is, for example, ransomware or other attackers just want to get information and want to stay undetected. And um, so if they want to spread, one of the first things, first of all, they need uh, yeah, pri more privileges. So uh, usually they try to escalate their privileges to get an administrative privilege of the local machine. And once that done, that's done, uh, they are looking for higher privileges. So for more privileged accounts, for example, if an administrator logs in with his uh, or her normal regular user account, to the work machine, but in some cases, if they also just maybe right click on PowerShell and run as another user, use the administrator account, that means already the credentials are in the system and the attacker could grab them and reuse them. And uh, once the attacker has credentials like that, um, they could do even more. But usually the first target um, is not the machine that has all these credentials. So they try to move laterally uh, to other machines using the same credentials and gather other credentials. And they do that until they have a really high privileged creden uh, credentials. So a, a high privileged identity. And in the best case, a domain administrator. And once they have hold over the main administrator account, they can do whatever they want to. They have control over their entire environment. And depending on what their goal is, they either stay in there, gather information, send it out. Usually there's also some kind of control mechanism established. So a command and control uh, that the attacker can control their victim machines. Um, and then, um, yeah, if information is the goal, they ex extract the information. If ransomware is the goal, at some point they start encrypting the machines and showing uh, the message that all your data is lost. Uh, so in in all these nightmare. examples, though, that we're talking about, it was. PowerShell kicked off after the breach had happened elsewhere, right? which tells me that PowerShell is not what they're using to get into the systems. It's just what they're doing to expand exactly. control once they're in there. Yes. And it could be every other tool. So it could be also Perl. It could be Python, whatever is there. But PowerShell is usually pre-installed on the system. So there are still attackers that are looking for PowerShell and uh, abusing it. Yeah. I think that if you have PowerShell configured, like you tell us to in your book, yes. I think that along the way they would have set off many alarms, especially if you're like feeding it into a sim or something like that, where yes. you can kind of collect information from your targets and be like, okay, why is that account logging in here? Or you know, why is this code running? What's going on here? Exactly. So um, that is basically uh, what you really should do. Uh, configure all the security controls for PowerShell and you are ahead of the attacker when they are trying to abuse PowerShell. And actually, attackers are also more and more moving to other options because, yes, PowerShell is quite secure and they have found that out as well. Um, there are still uh, groups that are using PowerShell, yes, but uh, there are many other groups that are just yeah, trying to use binaries or uh, other possibilities. Is security hard? <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> I, I don't find it hard because I, I really yeah, like doing security, like the consulting, also like the research or uh, like um, finding out how an attack happened and understand it. But um, it's... I think security is a lot of compromise, to be honest. 
because I, I worked with so many organizations. And when, when I started in security, when I wanted to, to really work in security, I was like, okay, everything needs to be secure. Um, I was an administrator back then. Uh, you can imagine how my users felt. Uh, they were not particularly happy that everything needed to be secured. Um, because if it's if the security is too strict, your users will find workarounds. And they will complain and talk your talk, talk to your boss <laughs> that you should help them using their Dropbox account or whatever. But um, yeah, um, basically, it's always a compromise because if you don't want your users to use Dropbox, you should offer them a secure alternative. And so you have to also think what your users want or what your users need and how your organization is working. Um, because if you, for example, have still a Windows, Windows XP machine somewhere in production, yes, you can tell the people in the hospital, for example, to take down the Windows XP machine. But in the end, if that's a machine where they have software from the year 2000, literally, and you tell them to uninstall that software, they will tell you there is no other option and millions of people's lives depend on it, for example, or production will stop or whatever. And um, in that case, the smarter option would be to isolate that machine and to only allow, yeah, control traffic. But yeah, so this is why I would not say security is hard, but security is full of compromises. Mm. So it seems like one of the major issues then would be adoption. Like you said, take away Dropbox. But if you just say you're not using Dropbox without saying, but here is an alternative, then people are going to find ways internally around the security, which makes it easier for everyone. Yes. Yeah, so if, if you are giving them, them an, an alternative, they are not going to find other uh, ways around it if it works for them. But if you just completely block Dropbox, completely drop OneDrive, completely block everything, then they are trying to find another solution and maybe the browser. Right, because we work in the context of a business and sometimes business choices need to be made and you can't you know, follow the best security practices as they're written down, right? You sometimes have exactly. to adapt them to your business and get business buy-in sometimes as well, especially for paid products and things like that. An actual adoption of new processes or things like that, it's going to be very hard to do that if there's just one person in security trying to yes. get it done. But I'm also not saying that uh, for production, uh, you should completely leave out security because you should always, yeah, try to get get, get the balance. Yeah. So for me, and maybe you, you view it differently, but being in security is just constant terror. Just no. because you, <laughs> like with, with me, I'm working against the, the system I'm running or, or the process. For, for you, you're running against an opposing force, which f feels to me more, more terrifying. Um, so for me, it's not terror because I, I just always found security super, super interesting. Um, and when, when, when I was a little girl, I, I thought, okay, maybe becoming a hacker would be cool, but that's illegal. So that's off the table. So my big, uh, wish was back then game designer or game developer. I never became game developer, to be honest. <laughs> and, um, but I, I just find it fascinating how attackers are operating and yeah, just security, securing the systems um, is also a way to understand how attackers are working and how people could circumvent certain mitigations. And yeah. It's like a fun, complex system. Yeah. Yes. One, one thing we learned when we interviewed I am Jacoby is if they get physical access to the machine, then it doesn't matter. It's yeah. pretty, pretty much over. Yes. If they have physical access to the machine, it's not your machine any longer. Yeah. 
Yep. That's <laughs> physical security is security too, right? There's yeah. not, I remember in my security classes, there was a ton of stuff on like key card and, and surfing in behind somebody and all these things. And I was like, I want the computer stuff, but you really do need those physical security controls, especially in some environments. Like it's, it's yes. pretty important. Yes. Especially if it's a domain controller, for example, because if you have physical access to a domain controller and the hard, hard disk is not encrypted, you can just mm -hmm. basically have all the hashes. And that is already yeah, the golden ticket to the entire environment, literally. Yeah. <laughs> so should so, I stop plugging in hard drive or uh, thumb drives are finally on the ground? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not the best idea. Yeah, you're supposed to plug this into someone else's computer so oh, they don't know it was you. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Not security advice. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you go about learning security, though? I know you mentioned PFE and kind of got some on-the-hand experience, but were you like a, a hack-the-box, trying to do CTFs type person, or were you in your lab kind of creating and going through examples? Because you just mentioned about you know getting the hard drive and getting the hashes off of it, and that's some, a process I've never gone through. But I imagine going through it once would give you quite a bit of insight and it wouldn't feel so magical. Like I think a lot of people hear this type of security stuff, they think it's magic. In reality, there's a lot of tools to do a lot of these things. You just need to know where to look. Yeah, so the first thing, I also thought it was magic when I wanted to get in security. And then I was really disappointed because everything is just so easy. <laughs> and yeah, so basically uh, you have those uh, videos uh, in your mind of hackers just doing whatever and uh basically most of the time it's social engineering and uh yeah just getting hashes from the hard drive is also not that much magic to be honest um but how did i get into security you asked um i wanted to get into security for a very long long time so um i already during my apprenticeship i already got in touch with security um, I worked with criminal researchers back then, and they were also uh, people that specialized on internet law. So I was doing an apprenticeship at the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Law. And I was just a, an administrator back then, but I got in touch with many interesting people. And um, I, got, I, I became a software developer later. And um, I was already interested in security, so I was always nagging about uh, securing our systems better. And in the end, I was able to convince them to uh, scan our code for uh, flaws. And I was the one who got uh, the task to fix those flaws. And in this process, I was also able to just experiment how those flaws worked. And um, yeah, later I also read everything I could on Twitter uh, about security, whatever I could find in my spare time. So for example, when I was riding uh, yeah, the tram or the subway, uh, I had some, some minutes and I also just tried it out. So I, back then, um, I don't know if that was a thing back then, hack the box, maybe it was, but I uh, did not do it back then i just tried it myself to be yeah that's that's the answer fair enough and i think that's a great way to learn get your hands on it try things out get some visibility into what seems like magic and then just like everything else in it it just becomes it's just how it works but she yeah. took it to the next level she recommended the starting of the processes and then took over the the mitigation so she she pushed the company towards it so she could get more hands on. That's genius. That's ownership right there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just was happy that I could fix those bugs and experiment with them. <laughs> I think it kind of sounds like you're similar to me in that when we work for an organization and we're responsible for something, we take that a little bit serious. Like if you're paying me to be responsible for this aspect of security, um, we're going, I'm going to do the right things to represent the business because otherwise it looks very bad on me. I have to work in this environment where potentially I'm like, it's just, it's just a no, no. You have to take ownership and do things the right way because you're stuck in this environment, assuming you keep your job. And even if you leave it, your reputation is part of it. Your coworker is like, 
yeah. the business risk. There's people's jobs that are on the line if you get really hit big time by a security uh, event. I mean, some companies have gone out of business after certain security events. So it's it's an important job. Yeah. And yeah, I still find it interesting, although the, the magic disappeared a little bit, but there are still some some areas that sparkle <laughs> with magic powder uh, so uh, that I haven't explored yet. Nice. You want to share any of those with us? Any other points of interest you're looking forward to learning more about? Yeah. So basically, I want to learn more about reverse engineering. So I already have some basics. Uh, but I really want to, yeah, just see the lady in the red dress uh, if we're talking matrix wise. And um, I also am looking into back bounty. So, oh, cool. Into the, the real deal. And yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. I've thought about but, stepping into that world. It seems pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. So, but it's still uh, such a big thing for me, and I'm just at the beginning. So uh, I never know if I will go far there. But uh, yeah, I, that's something that I'm currently interested in. Interested awesome. in. <laughs> well, speaking of both magic and things you're interested in, we saw on your GitHub, you have like an Excel spreadsheet that updates based on price. <laughs> I know I'm taking it out of computer security, but uh, for Magic the Gathering, yeah, Magic the Gathering, yeah. So you have like a you just track. I need this card for my deck, and it just tracks the current price for you. Or what all goes into this? Yeah. So uh, well, th this is already quite old. Uh, when when did I create it? I mean, years ago. Seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Seven years ago. Yes. <laughs> and um, basically. Uh, we were just building, so me and my husband were playing uh, Magic the Gathering uh, at that time uh, with real cards, and um, we were just creating another deck, or I was just creating another deck by that time, and I wanted to have some more cards, and I wanted to keep track what I need and how much it will cost. And uh, yeah, so basically when you're building a completely new deck, uh, it really helps to get everything at once. And for that, I uh, built that Excel spreadsheet and named it my deck wish list. <laughs> nice. And I yeah. think that it hit at a time, I think where land prices, the price of certain cards were going up quite a bit so probably pretty helpful but it's yeah. always fun to, to see what kind of people or what things people do outside of the office yeah and i think um it was don't don't hate me if i don't get the name right i think it was band spirits uh that i built back then <laughs> nice. awesome well jordan i think these are some easy questions jordan do you have any hard ones yeah there's nothing easier than security as we've learned here so we're going to get into the truly <laughs> difficult stuff now these are the common parameters if you will these are three questions we ask at the end of every interview each one is more difficult uh oh all right so first one are you ready i'm doing my best right. <laughs> yes what's one time something went wrong at the job and how did you or what did you learn from it can you just repeat the question please? Yeah. what's one time that something went wrong while on the job and what did you learn from from i guess fixing it That's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> um, something went wrong for me or in the environment? Anywhere that you can draw experience from. You could have got, uh, sent me the, this question <laughs> in advance. <laughs> well, it, um, it sounds to me like you have just a sterling record then. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just thought of something, um, but it's not something that really went wrong for me. Uh, but yeah, at, at some point um, when I was working as an admin, um, I yeah talked with uh, a consulting colleague and we talked about, um, no, that's also something private, metal <laughs> music. And uh, we wanted to share some music between our computers. 
And uh, back then, I just um, was at her uh, computer and I opened uh, my Explorer and typed in my IP address with uh, C dollar. So basically, yeah. Uh, so basically, the admin share and I hit enter and I copied the, the music. And so, some, some seconds later, I was like, Eva, did I just enter my admin credentials? And she was like, oh, I don't know, did you? And I was like, I don't know, let's try it again. And we tried it again. And I opened my admin share on my computer directly. And I just worked without prompting me for credentials. And uh, that was like, oh, um, gee, what is happening here? And then I just found out that my company, uh, now it's fixed, by the way, so nothing can happen from that. But my company uh, had created a GPO that allowed basically everybody to have admin rights on all the computers because they wanted to give their employees. So everybody was consultant or somehow out there at the customers, they needed administrative rights on their computers. And so they created a GPO that everybody had admin rights on all the computers. So is this where your love of GIA came from? Because this feels like a prime example of where it would be useful. Maybe, maybe, yes. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, what, what I did about it, uh, I immediately investigated why this was the co cause. And I found this uh, yeah, suspicious GPO. And um, then I created a new GPO. And um, since we still had um, yeah, only GPO to manage things back then, uh, I think it's different nowadays, but uh, yeah. Um, I created a GPO with uh, group policy preferences and a target. Um, and I think somewhere on my blog, there is also, let me, I, I will send you the link later. There is um, a tutorial on my blog, how we did that back then. Um, yeah, so that only one person had administrative rights on the computer they were assigned to. So, and we used the GPO and the Active Directory attributes to manage this. So you saved the day, basically. Yeah, maybe they did not know the impact back then, but <laughs> I hope so. Now we know that metal saves ears and environments. Exactly. All right, are you ready for the second question? Oh my God, this, the first one was already so hard. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> With everything you know now, what's one tip you'd give your younger self when you're first getting started? Hmm. That's also a very tough question. <laughs> and maybe directly go for the roles that I was interested in because I was um, always quite interested in either security or also game development. And what I did um, after becoming an, an administrator or after my apprenticeship, I um, became a software developer and I did not become a game developer. So, because I was too afraid to directly jump in there and I thought, okay, I need to have some experience in programming. And so I just became a developer and uh, just found out that this role was not for me. So, but maybe it would have been, yeah, may maybe I would have been more excited if I directly became a game developer or also directly going into security and not first becoming an administrator again and then shipping around it all the time. So maybe, yeah, the best advice is just shoot for the roles you want to work in and just try it if it works for you or not. I like that. Hey, Jordan. Yes. I'm thinking of a slight twist to this last question. All right. Could we, all right, I guess I'll ask it. So Miriam, what are, so normally we ask what 
three favorite modules people have. But since we have a security expert on, I was wondering if what are three of your favorite ways to keep up with security news, three resources that you use, three ways that kind of maybe keep you inspired or keep you just up to date? Yeah, so um, one way that I would have always recommended um, earlier was Twitter. But recently, um, yeah, the security community is split. Some are still on Twitter, some are on Mastodon. Um, so it's gotten a little bit harder to keep track, but I still find uh, good resources in Twitter. I still find good resources on Mastodon. So maybe the first advice is, uh, or the first way is, um, yeah, just follow on social media of your choice. Might, may it be Twitter, may it be Mastodon people that you find interesting, that you want to learn from. Um, yeah. Um, the next source. So one thing that you just mentioned was to, to be inspired. Um, it's maybe not a source, but I, at some point I came up with the term uh, North Star Go. And this happened um, when I became a PM. Um, basically, this role was already uh, the highest role I could achieve back then in my mind uh, at Microsoft because um, all the other roles I would have needed to relocate. And um, when I became a PM, I just fell into a hole. I just reached my goal and what was there? Nothing. And I was like, okay, what now? I was super depressed, <laughs> although I just reached my goal. So, uh, yeah. And then I thought, okay, what, what do I want from my career? What do I want to do? And so I thought of my North Star, North Star goal. And um, basically my North Star goal is, uh, has to do with back bounty. So this is why I'm going that direction. Um, because I really admire the skills that the people have from Google Project Zero. And it does not need to be Google Project Zero. It could also be at Microsoft or wherever, but I want to have those skills and I want to be able to work in such a role and to have those skills that I admire. And so the first, um, for me, the North Star goal was something that is unachievable. So that I think that I will never reach just to stay motivated. And, but every step into that direction is a right step. And so for me, the next step was to become a security researcher. And although that already seemed uh, impossible because I would have needed to relocate if I would not have gotten this exception that I got, um, then it would have been impossible for me. And so for me, the next step was first to become a security researcher, uh, the step in the right direction. And this is why I'm just now living the dream. And next step is to get more familiar with bug bounties and reverse engineering. Well, that's awesome. And I believe in you. I can't wait to see where you <laughs> Thank go next. You. <laughs> Hope you'll talk to us again when you're solving all these bug bounties and have this new perspective on things. So awesome. Thank you. I have a recommendation uh, for a, a, a other option as well. Maybe some kind of book about PowerShell automation and scripting. Yes. <laughs> Get yours now. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, books are also really, really good. Uh, so not only mine, but there are also tons of other books out there that I still would love to read, that I'm already reading, that I have already read and um, could recommend. So, uh, yeah. But yes, please get my book. It's great. <laughs> it is great. Plus one Thank to you. that. All right. Well, I'm not sure if you're aware, Miriam, but this entire time you've been in this discussion, you've been the presence of a, a, a true icon, uh, someone that world around people come to just to witness Andrew shill a podcast. Worldwide. Uh, so you, you have the distinct pleasure of a front row seat to the premier shillsman of this world. All right, take it away, Andrew. Listeners, 
Thank you for joining us today. I've had a great time and you have as well. I just know. Um, thank you so much for listening to us today. If you enjoyed what you heard, or even if you didn't, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform of choice. Wherever you listen, we're here for you. YouTube, give us a like, a comment, maybe even a subscription. Tell us what your favorite security resource is. I'm curious. I like to know. If you got feedback, positive, negative, want to share a story, PowerShell at PDQ.com is a way to reach out to Jordan and I. Two in one, two birds, one stone. Let us know. You can find us on social media. I'm Andrew Plotek. He's Jordan Hammond. Miriam, where can people find you if they want to tap in and, and see where you go next and see what you're up to? Uh, so I'm on Twitter. I'm on Mastodon. <laughs> so on both. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, under Miriam Xura. So I, I will send it to you. And um, on Mastodon, uh, I am MW. I will also send you the name later. And on LinkedIn, I'm Miriam Wiesner. And since you already stalked my book, my blog and my GitHub uh, repository. I'm quite certain that you already have those links. So um, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking with you, learning more about you. We hope you'll join us in the future sometime. We'd love to get the opportunity to chat again. I would be happy to. So uh, thank you so much. I had a great time uh, talking with you. And uh, yeah, awesome. I hope to talk to you soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks for joining the PowerShell Podcast with your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. They're serious. They mean what they're saying. The PowerShell Podcast is a production of PDQ.com.